All of God's people said, take your Bible, turn to Psalm 77, it's where we're going to start this morning. We are going to end up in Galatians 5, if you want to turn there, keep your Bible there, we're going to start out with a few verses before we get to Galatians, so have your Bibles ready to turn. Uh, did you bring a Bible to God's house this morning? You should. I want you to... Uh, when I put verses up on the screen, I want you to mark those verses in your Bible. Later on, when you go back and read that, maybe God will remind you of something that came out during the message, or God will remind you of something that He showed you at one time in your life. And this morning, uh, the message I'm going to preach, uh, I've already determined I'm not going to give an altar call at the end, and you'll find out why in a minute. That's not to say that we probably, that's not to say we wouldn't need prayer at the end. Because as you are going to find out, we need a lot of prayer. Um, let me see if I can, somebody sent me a message this morning. And it was something that somebody, one of their Facebook friends, had. Apparently there was a, a rally somewhere for every kind of perversion that there is. They call them pride rallies, gay pride rallies. And this shocked me. I'm looking right at it. It's not on, I don't really want to put it on the screen, but it shocked me. Uh, the Facebook post said, I'd like to thank everyone who came out to show their support. Sorry we didn't have enough signs for everyone. We weren't expecting so many supporters. The signs that they were holding up were to honor the LGBT and P crowd. Lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgendered, the P, does anybody, pedosexual, I couldn't believe it when I saw, I, I asked the person, I said, is this for real, and they said, yeah. This is a sick world. And it's not getting better. The problem is, is that any one of those things that I called out could be in any church in America. Some, you would expect it. Some of these liberal churches, where everything goes, you would expect that. But it's not just in the liberal churches. It's in the conservative ones, too. They just cover it up better. So with that being said, Psalm 77, verse 6. I call to remembrance my song in the night. I commune with mine own heart, and my spirit made diligent search. Will the Lord cast off forever? Will He be favorable no more? Is His mercy clean gone forever? Doth His promise fail forevermore? If you've ever been honest, you've thought that. You may have experienced a time, or may be experiencing now, a time when you're not sure that God's going to forgive you again. So verse 9 says, Hath God forgotten to be gracious? Hath He in anger shut up His tender mercies? Selah. Verse 10, And I said, This is my infirmity. But I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the works of the Lord. 
Surely I will remember thy wonders of old. I will meditate also of all thy work and talk of all thy doings. So this morning I'm going to preach on an infirmity that you have that others have. And in the Bible, the word infirmity, it does imply like physical diseases, sicknesses, things like that. We call the flu an infirmity or a cold or maybe some disease an infirmity of the flesh. But there is another infirmity mentioned in the Bible. And that is the infirmity of sin. And I mentioned a while ago that we were singing that song, Look and Live. And that goes back to the time when the Israelites mumbled, murmured against God. And God sent fiery serpents. And they bit a number of people into the thousands had died from that. So with the infirmity, God provided a remedy. But I... I am positive, I am positive of one thing today. And that is, these infirmities affect church people and non-church people alike. Romans six nineteen. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness... And to iniquity, unto iniquity. See, he's connecting it here. Even so, now yield your members, servants to righteousness, unto holiness. He's referring to the members of your body. Your hands, your feet. Your ears. Is there, I'm going to use the phrase, pornographic. Is there pornographic music out there? Absolutely. A younger generation, it may be more explicit now than it was when I was growing up. But when I go back and look at the lyrics of some of the songs I grew up on, I'm going, that's filthy. So your ears have infirmities. Your eyes. Your mind. As ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. You can say, well, I'm saved. I know God's going to forgive my sins. Now think about what I just said. God's going to forgive my sins. And it implies this idea that if I sin, God's going to forgive it. You know what that's called? That's called being presumptuous. And the false teachers, false prophets of the world, the false believers, false converts, are those that are presumptuous. They presume that they can sin infinitely with God. God will infinitely forgive that sin without any repercussion whatsoever, without any desire to change whatsoever. So as long as I keep sinning, God will keep forgiving. So there's no way I could go to hell, so I just keep sinning. That's not what this Bible teaches. Romans 15. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak, not to please ourselves. I believe in that. Now, if we're thinking about the infirmities only applies to sicknesses and diseases. I mean, I can see that surely the responsibility of a church would be to visit those that are sick or pray for those that are sick. Sometimes we will anoint people with oil, pray for their healing. It's up to God whether he's going to heal them or not. But not only the infirmities as far as sickness is concerned, but infirmities as far as sin is concerned. We then that are strong are to, are to bear the infirmities of the weak. There are people in this church that struggle with certain things more than other people do but those people who don't struggle with a they struggle with b or c it just depends nobody nobody gets through life without being a sinner christ died for sinners christ died to forgive sins 
but he died and lives again also to change sinners. So we then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written. I want you to look at what the Bible says. The reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. And this is Christ saying that. Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. That we through patience and comfort of scriptures might have hope. There is hope for you, by the way. Matthew eight sixteen. When the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils. And he cast out, and he cast out the spirits with his word. Look at that. What is it that drives devils away? The word of God. Why doesn't the why is it that the word of God is now absent in so many areas of our country, now absent from our churches? Because the devil don't want it. And the devil has taken over churches because there is no word there. There's no word to drive the devils out. And with no word, they'll just, they'll just cave in. You also, will, that'll happen to you. Um, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils. He cast out the spirits with his word and healed that were sick. That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet saying himself took our infirmities and bear our sicknesses. So, yes, it implies sicknesses, but it also implies sin. He took our sins on himself who knew no sin. Hebrews 4, verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passing to the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Your profession is your profession of faith. That you believe God, that you believe God's word, that you are trying to live a holy and a clean life. And the devil will try to talk you out of that life by sin. How many of you know that? I know it. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. So let's think about this. Eve was tempted with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. She failed. Adam failed. Jesus was tempted with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. He passed. And yet, he took your failures on himself being condemned for you in your place and in my place. And we don't deserve it, but that's what he did for us. But was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now I'm giving you the good stuff first. I'm giving you, because what I'm going to say after this is going to be hard. It's going to be hard to preach, it's going to be hard to listen to. I want you to know that there is hope for everybody with every kind of sin. Every kind of sin. There's hope. You can go boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and to find grace to help in time of need. We usually don't look for grace when we don't need it. It's when we need it. That's when we're looking for it. And when we need it is when we sin. Galatians 5. Now turn there. This is where, and I, I, may, I may preach a, a series of messages on Galatians 5 here. I may not. It, it may be. I felt like God was leading me in this direction. I don't know. Who, I, I, and I'm going to be dead honest with everybody. Please understand me. I do not have anybody in mind preaching this. So that guilt you're going to feel is not me singling you out. 
Okay? That guilt you're going to feel is from the Holy Ghost. He's singling you out. He has a right to. I don't. So I may, I may preach a whole series of message on the works of the flesh. But then I may, it may just be this one. I don't know. Galatians 5.13. For brethren, you've been called unto liberty. Now let me tell you. Well, let me finish this. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. But, lo- but, but by love serve one another. I have heard too many people who justify their sin by saying we're not under the law, we're under grace or some form of that. They justify their own sin or excuse it or they'll even get all bent out of shape when guys like us, when we preach repentance, they get all out of shape. Oh, you, oh, you believe in repentance? Well, that's works. And they don't, they just decry against Christians repenting under some obscure idea of salvation that since salvation is without any works, then obviously you don't have to repent to be saved. So therefore God saves you and, and since you didn't have to repent, I just got it in my mind that the people who say they don't have to repent probably never do. Repentance is like a muscle. And when you don't use a muscle for a while, it gets weak. Sometimes it'll get atrophied. And the first time you have to use it, you're sore for a few days. Right? But use that muscle enough and you're strengthened by it. I think you ought to repent often. Because you you are often messed up. But but I I have heard it too many times. People that say, well, I don't have to repent. They probably don't. But there's things to repent of. Is there not? Galatians 5.13 For brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. So think about the two commandments that we're under. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And the second one is love your neighbor as yourself. So, the first four things that he mentions here as being the works of the flesh, they go right to the heart of loving the Lord your God and loving your neighbor. And your neighbor could be your own spouse. Right? For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. Can I, I'm going to throw this in now. I'm pretty sure that it's listed in the works of the flesh. It is. Hatred, variances, envyings, seditions. That when all you do is spend your time gossiping about everybody else, that's not love your neighbor. Amen? You spend your time running everybody else in the church down, that's not love your neighbor. That's, I love me, and if I can knock down everybody else, I look better. That's all that is. So, verse 16, this I say then, walk in the Spirit. You know what that means? Think Bible. 
I gave you a hat to remind you. Think Bible. Walk in the Bible. I think Dwight L. Moody said, the Bible will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from the Bible. One or the other. Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit is against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. So I'm going to give you guys just a minute. The kids are going downstairs. We're going to feed them. Because they got to... Because when I get done preaching, I want to get in a van and go... Boom. Okay? So I'm going to give you a minute. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh, for the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are the contrary, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. If you want to live right for God, sin will keep you from it. If you want to sin, you being in the Word of God and being in prayer will keep you from sin. If it works one way, it works the other way, doesn't it? There's two, lane, two lanes on the highway. They both go back and forth. When I came to church, I went down the road. And when I'm going back home, I go back down the same road. It works both ways. So if I want to read my Bible and pray, my sin keeps me from that. But when I want to sin, me reading my Bible praying keeps me from that. See how it works? But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now, those, anybody who would say, well, bless God, we're, under, we're not under the law anymore. We're under grace. We're not under the law. There is a but here. But, if ye be led by the Spirit, then you're not under the law. But to everybody out there who's not being led by the Spirit, let me tell you, you are under every law that God has. Because you won't do right. And you, you've got every law that's going to be held over you. Now, I'm going to preach on four things this morning. Then I'm going to let you go. Here they are. Now the works of the flesh are manifest which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. Those four, all in verse 19. Then verse 20 starts out with a, with a different set of things. But it's interesting to me that these four are linked together. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, which we always said when somebody told a joke, that was lascivious in nature, we called it a dirty joke, right? And it's true, it's unclean. Magazines that you look at, those are dirty magazines. And they are, they're unclean, right? So, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach on these things, and I'm not going to hold anything back. And... I'm not preaching to everybody that's driving up and down American Legion Drive. They're not in here listening. You are. So I'm preaching to you. I'm preaching to church people. The works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. Lasciviousness. That's just having a dirty mind, a dirty lifestyle. Anything, anything of, a, the nat of the nature of adultery and fornication is lasciviousness. We have a law. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Is that law still good? 
Is it still valid? Let's go to the Lord and pray. Father, there is none righteous, no, not one. All we like sheep have gone astray. And Father, I don't know what any of these people do when they're not in this room. But I know people. I know grown-up people. And I know, God, that we are very unclean people. We are lascivious in our nature. We are lustful. We have inherited it from our parents. They inherited it from their parents. And it goes all the way back to Adam and Eve, who, in, who gave us lust of the flesh and lust of the eyes. We were born in iniquity. We were made in our mother's womb under sin. So God, there is none of us righteous. No, not one. And Father, we thank you that you sent Jesus, your son, your obedient son, to die on a cross for our adultery, our fornication, our uncleanness, and our lasciviousness. And Father, we thank you that these things can be forgiven. But as Samuel reminded Saul, to obey is better than sacrifice. It's better to not do these things than it is to be forgiven of doing these things. And Father, I'm well aware of the times that we live in with televisions, radios, iPods, iPhones, tablets, computers, movie screens, everywhere are full of adultery and fornication and uncleanness and lasciviousness. They're full of it. There is almost no place clean. Almost no clean things to watch. No clean things to listen to. It's everywhere. It's infecting the adults. And it is increasingly infecting our children. And Lord, please help us to protect our children as best as we can. Because the pedophiles are everywhere. And now they're being celebrated. God have mercy on your people. God forgive us of our sins. God cleanse us. But Father, chasten us. Chastise us. The harder the chastisement, the better it will be for us. Because there is no place clean and no body clean. Father, help me to preach this message. Help me do it in love. I'm giving people hope. But Father, the best hope has to come through us meeting our sins head on. Not acting like it doesn't exist. Because it won't go away. Except we deal with it first. So Father, help your people. Bless your word, I pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said. Turn to Acts chapter 15. Now for those of you who would uh, want to be against what I'm saying here, we have a law, thou shalt not commit adultery. You might be inclined to say, well, we're not under the law, so out goes that, out the door. So then let's go to the New Testament. In the New Testament, the issue came up in the book of Acts about whether or not the Gentiles had to keep the law to be saved. Particularly, the issue came up of circumcision. Should the Gentiles be circumcised as according to the law? Or could they just not 
have to be circumcised, not have to keep the law, can they still be saved without keeping the law? Well, they gathered together in Jerusalem. And in Acts chapter 15, we have, the, we have the minutes of that meeting. They recorded the meeting for us. And it wasn't the Pope who said this. There was no Pope here. The apostles that were here were in on even seating with the elders and the bishops. They were all there as one group. No, no one person was dictating to the group what everybody else had to believe, what everybody else had to come under. The Holy Spirit was going to use certain men to bring up the ideas, but they were all agreed as to, as to how this should be, should be dealt with. Peter was there, Paul was there, James, John was there, all the disciples, all the elders of the church, which are the elder men of the church, the bishops were there, and they were all gathered together, and they were, they, once they brought up the subject, and they gave certain testimony, then James stood up and said, guys, uh, let's be honest, we're Jews, we've been Jews all of our life, and we were circumcised when we were all children, but the truth of it is, why would we make the Gentiles bear a burden that we never kept? In other words, James was saying, let's be honest. The Jews, we didn't keep the law. Oh yeah, we were circumcised as children, but we broke it. Right as soon as we could, we started breaking God's laws. So let's not pretend that we keep the law and we have to make the Gentiles keep the law. So let's just say that as far as the law is concerned, if they're Gentiles, leave them Gentiles. But! There's four things that we're going to tell the Gentiles this is how it has to be. So in Acts 15, verse 18, here's what James is saying. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Wherefore my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write unto them that they abstain. Do you know what that word means? Don't do it. That they abstain from, number one, pollutions of idols. We would all agree to that. Amen? You don't see any Jesuses and Marys and Josephs in this church. Number two, from fornication. Number three, from things strangled. Number four, from blood. We don't drink blood in our church. We drink the fruit of the vine. But it's not blood. It represents the blood, but it's not blood. We don't drink blood. We don't eat the flesh of Jesus hanging from the cross. We don't do that. We eat the communion wafer, represents the body, but we don't eat his flesh, we don't drink his blood. But he specifically mentioned fornication. Now, fornication is like adultery. These are catch-all words. They're not just strictly limited to one little thing that other people do, which then would exclude what you do. It is a catch-all statement. Adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness covers it all. The marriage bed should be honored and it should be undefiled. That's what the Bible says. The bed should be undefiled. So I don't have to stand here and spell out, nor would I be inclined to, even though most of the kids are downstairs. I'm not going to stand here and spell out every little thing that this covers. Suffice it to say that it covers everything. With the exception of one man with his wife together. That is the only exclusion allowed by God. Period. Everything else, and I mean everything else, is off limits and it's unclean. It is adultery. It is fornication. And we're told not to do it. Romans chapter 1. For time's sake, I'm going to, get it, going to get to the heart. You know me, I like to, if I'm going to study something out, I'm going, to, I'm going to overdo it. I always have this fear that I'm going to come here some Sunday and not have enough verses to preach on. So, I mean, I'm, I'm already late. I've got to get on down the road, but I've got to preach this message. 
So verse 28 of Romans chapter 1, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Now I'm going to ask you, I'm asking church members, would you like God to give you over to a reprobate mind? You know what reprobate means, right? No probation. Probation is a second chance. You're not giving it. When you're reprobate, you have shown the courts that you, that given a second and a third and a fourth chance is not something that's good for society. We need to execute judgment against you, lock you up, execute you if need be, and keep you away from everybody else because you're infectious. That's what reprobate means. Right? Would you like for God to turn you over to a reprobate mind? Adultery will do it. Fornication will do it. Watching videos online will do it. Hiding magazines out in your shed or your truck will do it. Looking at all the women at the workplace will do it. Looking at women or men in the church house will do it. God forbid that we have an extramarital affair going on in the church. In this church. God forbid that. But likewise, God also forbid some of the things that probably have gone on in this church. I don't know anything. I'm not presuming to know anything. I don't want you to think I know anything. I'm just, I know people. And the first thing that Paul mentioned in Galatians, that pretty much nails everybody in some form or fashion. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness and lasciviousness, it is everywhere we go. It is in every form of media. And I would not, I would not even think for a minute to say that it, it doesn't affect anybody in this church. Because I know better. Because I know we're adults. So... You don't want to be given over to a reprobate mind. Verse 29 spells it out. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication. Second thing he mentioned was fornication. Wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. There's 23 things here. So... Fornication, it, again, is a catch-all word. It covers it all. Anything that is not within the bounds of one husband with one wife, it covers everything. Verse 32, look at your Bible. Look at verse 32. Who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death. Is your Bible right or wrong? <laughs> It brings death. It will bring death to a church. It will bring death to your marriage. Won't it? What if your wife caught you? What if your husband caught you? See, I don't just think it's just the men we got to worry about. This affects everybody. It would destroy your marriage. Destroy your family, destroy your church, destroy your reputation. Our country recognized several years ago that we have such a problem with these four things that they had to write a new law covering things like this. It's called a register of sex offenders. We had to write a law that said 
that with this particular type of crime, whoever was guilty of it, even after their sentence was over with and their probation was over with, they had to be put on a list and your name never comes off that list, ever. It follows you around everywhere you go. We had, to, we had to write a law because the problem was getting so bad with repeat offenders. They would offend, they'd get thrown in jail, they'd get out, do it again. Get out, do it again. Get out of jail, do it again. So they had to come up with a, a list. We have to put these people on list and we have to follow them around. They cannot be certain places. They cannot go to certain events. They can't do certain things. We have to restrict them. And this follows them the rest of their life. How'd you like to be put on that list? Knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death. But then look at the rest of it. Not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. That's, that's watching it on TV or the internet or reading about it in a book or listening to it in music. You paid. You paid for it. You watched it. You listened to it. You made the people that do it millionaires. And God said, it's not just the people doing it that's guilty, it's the people that have pleasure in them that do it. They're as worthy of much, as much as death as the people that do it. That's how God sees it. You might have a little bit different idea in your mind about how yours really isn't harming anybody, but you're just as guilty as the people that do it. 1 Corinthians 5. God said, it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. Paul was talking about a church. He was, talking, he was saying this to the Corinthian church. It is reported in your church that there's fornication in your church. And he said such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. Stepmom. And he said, you're puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from you. So he said in verse 4, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. How would you like to be turned over to Satan? How would you like to be turned over to the devil? How would you like for God to just give up on you? See, you're counting on that God will keep forgiving you, and God will keep forgiving you, and God will keep forgiving you. And it's sort of just become the idea of how you live. I'll keep doing it. God will keep forgiving me. But at some point, God says, how about if I just turn you over to the devil? How's that? Verse 6, your glorying is not good. Know ye not, notice what this is in the context of. Know ye not that a little leaveneth, leaveneth the whole lump. Now what is that in the context of? It's in the context of fornication. So how much leaven? Let me, let me just kind of go down a list here. Let's look at leaven for a minute. How many thoughts... How many dirty thoughts would it take? Let's say that you're looking at somebody. Somebody you know. Neighbor. Co-worker. Church member. You're looking at somebody. And your mind just starts wandering. There's a term for that in the Bible. It's called filthy dreamers. And your mind starts wandering. How much of that mind wandering would it take before you started making plans of fulfilling the lust that's in your mind? 
How much would it take? The Bible says a little. How many dirty pictures can you look at before it starts taking effect? How many dirty jokes can you listen to before you start? How much music can you listen to with filthy, filthy stuff in it? By the way, Bethel Church, don't listen to rap, hip-hop, metal. What else? What am I, I'm not even caught up with the music that's out there anymore. I'm still in, stuck in the 70s. Country? Huh? Techno? How much of that music can you listen to? See, a little leaven, a little leaven, a little leaven will destroy your life. Will it not? Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that you may be a new lump as you are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. You know what that means? Purge out your music list. Purge out your internet list. Purge out your TV channel list. Just get rid of it all. Because how much of it can you take back in before it, you're right back where you used to be? Very little. First Corinthians 5, verse 9, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. You're not even supposed to be around them. Why? Because what they're doing, you'll fall in it. Do you really think that you can hang around with swingers and not swing? Yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world. In other words, not only the fornicators, the covetousness, the extortioners, the idolaters. For then you must needs go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such an one, no, not to eat. You're not supposed to take communion if you're guilty of that. For what have I do to judge them also that are without? Do you not judge them that are within? So, that, that, that pride fest that they had that the guy said, Boy, I'm glad we had that. We didn't have enough posters. And the posters celebrated the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgendered pedophile. We would say, Ah, that's that sick world we live in. That stuff's part of the world. I'll have no part of that. And yet, I guarantee you at least a small part of that stuff is in most churches in one person or another in one way or another. You think I just woke up yesterday? 1 Corinthians 6, 13, Meats for the belly and belly for the meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. God has raised up the Lord, and who will raise up us by his own power? Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two saith he shall be one flesh. And he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Remember, that's a catch-all word. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committed fornication sinneth against his own body. What? 
Know ye not that your body is the temple of what kind of ghost? Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and ye are not your own. This nonsense about the women saying, what I do with my body is my business. Uh, that's not your body. For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are God's. 1 Corinthians 10, 5, But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Look at your Bible. Now these things were our, were our examples. They were our examples. I'm sick and tired of this crowd saying, well, the Old Testament, that's for Israel. That's not for us. That's for us. There are examples. Do you think God loves you more than He loves them? Now these were our examples the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be idolaters as were some of them as it is written. People sat down to eat and drink, rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day. Three and twenty thousand. God killed three and twenty thousand people for fornication alone. Just for fornication. Give you something to think about. Next time you think about it. Can I get away? Can I do this and get away with this? Can I do this and still be a Christian? Can I do this and, and still go to church and honor Christ? What about, can I do this and live through it? Ephesians 5, be ye therefore followers of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savior. See, God gave us marriage. Did He not? Marriage is honorable in the bed undefiled. Honey, I love you. And you've been looking at men at work or men in movies or men at the store or men everywhere. You're looking at men or you're, you're looking at women. You think your wife or your husband would really think you love them? But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become as saints. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting. That covers all the jokes and the comedians. Oh, I remember, I remember... When I was a teenager and a kid at school gave me a Richard Pryor tape, listening to it with my headphones on so mom wouldn't hear it, and then try not to laugh, because if mom came in and asked me what I was laughing at, she would know, and I'd get caught. So it includes all the filthy jokes, too which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of God, a kingdom of Christ and of God. Is it worth, is it worth your, is it worth your soul? Is fulfilling the lust of your eyes, is it worth your soul? What whore or harlot would you go to hell for? I mean, I'd die for my wife. But would I want to go to hell for anybody else's wife? Ain't worth it, guys. Colossians 3, If you then be riven with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. By the way, this is things above. This right here. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God, who, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with Him in glory. Mor mortify, you know what that means? Kill Him. Therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection. See the word inordinate, you know what that means? Not ordinary. Your ordinary affection should be your spouse, Period. Period. 
Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence. Had to look that one up. That means, con means with. See the C-U-P-I part? It's where we get the word Cupid from. Cupid means desire. Concupis concupiscence means wicked desires. It's Listen. You don't have to have the videos and the pictures to have the lust. For which things sake wrath, the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. But now ye also put off all these things, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy. Verse 10, to put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Aren't you ready for a new man? Aren't you ready for a new body? Furthermore, 1 Thessalonians, we beseech you, brethren, and extort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so you walk and abound more and more. That means there should be more and more of you reading your Bible and praying and doing things that are right and less and less of fornication. More and more means less and less of the other stuff. Now, I know, listen to me, I know that it's very rare for God to just take some things away right away. But bless God, at some point, it becomes less and less, not more and more. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. That every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. What makes you different than anybody else that's not saved? Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to forn fornication, going after strange flesh, and are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise, also these filthy dreamers, you fantasizers, fantasizers, that's what that is. Daydream about this stuff. I'm going to, I need to close. Turn to Philippians 4. Man, I said I wasn't going to preach past 1205. Philippians 4. Turn in your Bible. Here's how you do it. Now, I want to say something to you. And I want everybody listening to me online and everybody listening to me here. Because I've had people call me and ask me about these issues. I'm telling you, there is no magic trick and no magic words to make them instantly go away. Through our lifetimes, we fill our suitcases up with lust. Which means that even after we're saved, we're carrying around baggage. It's not easy to just walk away and, unless God supernaturally does something for you, which he can. But if he doesn't, then he means to train it out of you. Chastise it out of you. That means there is not a magic spell, a magic word, a magic thought that you can... Because people say, Pastor, how, how can I quit doing this? Tell me how I stop. I want to stop today. Tell me how I stop. I don't, there's not a magic word. If there was, I would give it. But there is training. There is chastisement. Let God do both. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on... He just told you to think Bible. He just told you in eight things, he told you to think Bible. Fill your mind with something else for crying out loud. 
G-I-G-O. Do you know what that means, Kevin? Gigo. Garbage in. Now it makes sense, right? It's a programming thing. Computer programmers. Garbage in, garbage out. You put garbage in, you're going to get garbage out. You put good things in, you're going to get good things out. Let God train you. Let God chasten you. Let God have your mind and let God have your eyes and let God have the rest of your body. Let's bow our heads.